everybody, what's going on? And welcome to another video. And as always, before we get started today, I'd just like to take a quick moment to welcome all my new subscribers and to thank everybody who's leaving me comments and messages down below. Thank you guys, I really appreciate it. And all right guys, so for today's video, we are actually going to be covering the Titanic Sea Days. So from, we already made a video covering the events of April 10th when the Titanic left Southampton, went to Cherbourg and then carried on. And we're gonna start this video on April 11th and go up to the evening of April 14th, right up to the iceberg impact. In the video that I'm going to make covering the actual sinking, we're gonna talk about the iceberg impact and then all the events of the sinking. For this video, we're just gonna cover the Titanic Sea Days and note any worthwhile events that may have occurred on each of those days. April 11th, 1912. The RMS Titanic, after traveling overnight from Cherbourg, France, arrived in Queenstown, Ireland in the morning of this day. Once it got to Queenstown, Ireland, it was planning to drop off a few passengers and pick up around 200 more passengers that were leaving from Ireland bound for America. April 11th, 1912 was a pretty routine day on board the RMS Titanic. Not that, not that many eventful things did occur. One thing to, of note is that when the Titanic was actually about to pull into Queenstown, it does seem that they actually put the ship through some maneuverability tests. Like they had the ship do these big turns and stuff like that just to kind of test the ship. So that's pretty interesting. But now when the Titanic arrived in Queenstown, even though the Titanic could fit at the dock, they decided instead to keep the Titanic kind of out in the bay of Queenstown and have a ferry come out and bring passengers, cargo, take any passengers from the Titanic to land. They decided to do that instead of having the ship pull all the way up to the pier. And this was because they wanted a quicker turnaround time. So if the Titanic would have pulled all the way up to the pier and docked, then it would have taken longer for them to pull the ship out, you know, get the Titanic turned around and get it headed back out to sea. But so by keeping the ship out in the bay and having ferries bring people, cargo, passengers, etc., onto the Titanic, this would greatly accelerate how much time it would take to get the Titanic back underway once dealing with all the passengers was complete. One other interesting thing did happen before the Titanic left Queenstown. You see, as the Titanic was unloading the last of its passengers that were heading over to Queenstown, one crew member on board the ship who actually signed up to work on the Titanic from Southampton and go all the way to America and basically be with the Titanic for its entire voyage, decided to jump ship while the Titanic was in Queenstown. So essentially what he did was he said he was going to work on the Titanic just so he could get free passage from Southampton to Ireland, which is honestly kind of funny when you think about it. Around 1.30 p.m. in the afternoon, the Titanic finally left Queenstown, Ireland, bound for the United States. This photo you see right here is one of the final photos taken of the RMS Titanic, quite possibly the last photo ever taken of this ship. But yep, once all the passengers left the Titanic and all the new passengers got on board, the Titanic weighed anchor and sailed off into the unknown for its maiden voyage. After the Titanic left Queenstown, the rest of the day went pretty much without incident, you know? The passengers got settled on board, you know, everybody was just getting ready for their daily routine, and they were just gearing up to enjoy the voyage. So the next day on board the Titanic will be April 12th, and it will be the Titanic's very first full day at sea. It is now April 12th, 1912, the RMS Titanic's first full day at sea. She's cruising along, making good progress, traveling at a speed of right around 21 knots, or roughly 20 to 25 miles per hour, somewhere in that ballpark. Which is really impressive, considering that the Titanic was actually designed to go at this speed. But what many people don't know, and this is big proof that the Titanic wasn't going for any kind of speed record, is that not all of the boiler rooms were lit. You see, the Titanic had six boiler rooms, and only boiler rooms six through, uh, six through two were actually lit up throughout the voyage. Boiler room one was never turned on, period, not even during the sinking. So that's quite impressive that the Titanic is traveling at near cruising speed or maximum speed with only five of its six boiler rooms lit up. So that is proof right there that the Titanic was not going for any kind of speed record. The most notable event from this day on board the Titanic came in the form of an ice warning. You see, on this day, the Titanic received its first ice warning from a steamship called the Lauterin, but it wasn't an official ice warning. You see, most of the message was just to the captain, you know, congratulating him on his new command, wishing the Titanic luck on its maiden voyage, and it was more like, by the way, we passed some ice. So even though it was an ice warning, it wasn't an official ice warning. Just think of it like, by the way, we encountered some ice. Captain Smith did send a message back to that other ship, thanking them for their letter, and he also made a note of where that ice was so the Titanic would be prepared for it. 
But yeah, the rest of the day pretty much went without incident. One semi-amusing thing did happen. Uh, Thomas Andrews got a little bit homesick. So everybody's favorite baker, Charles Yalkin, we all know who he is now, uh, he actually made Thomas Andrews some bread just to help him feel a little bit better. But yeah, besides that, there was a dinner party in the restaurant. Bruce Ismay had some friends over to his stateroom. And yeah, pretty much the rest of the day went without incident. And that is what happened on April 12th, 1912 on board the RMS Titanic. April 13th, 1912. This is one of the most eventful sea days that occurs on board the RMS Titanic. April 13th, 1912 was definitely a very eventful day on board the RMS Titanic. The first thing of note is actually that the Titanic was making extremely good time. She actually covered a little bit more distance on this day than she did the day before. She was actually covering so much distance that the people on board the ship, both the crew and the passengers, thought the Titanic might arrive in New York a day early. But now, when I say arrive in New York a day early, I don't mean that the passengers, the ship would pull up to the pier and the passengers would get off. Essentially, what they did was they had what's called a light ship. There was a light ship in Southampton and a light ship in New York. And when the vessel passes that ship in both places, that's when the voyage is either set, counted as complete or, or starting and complete. Pass the light ship in Southampton, voyage starts. Pass the light ship in New York, voyage ends. So they were talking that they might actually arrive in New York a day early, which is crazy considering that they hadn't lit all of the Titanic's boiler rooms at this point. Another key event happened on board the RMS Titanic today. You see, ever since the Titanic had left Southampton, there had been a small coal fire burning in the starboard coal bunker of boiler room number six. So they had been working to put out this coal fire since the Titanic left Southampton. And what they had to do to put this fire out was they moved all of the coal from the starboard coal bunker, dousing the fire as they went, and put it into the port side coal bunker. It's important for you guys to understand just how big of a deal it was for them to put out that coal fire on the Titanic. We're talking about them moving hundreds of tons worth of coal. And they had moved so much coal from the starboard side of the Titanic to the port side of the Titanic to put out this fire, that they had, it had a noticeable effect on the trim of the Titanic. So as the Titanic was sailing along, as soon as they put out that coal fire, the Titanic was actually listing about three degrees to port due to all that extra weight of the coal that was now moved from the starboard to the port side. Think of it kind of like um, when you fly an airplane, you have to make sure that all the weight is balanced on the plane so you have a more stable flight. It was a similar concept to this. They had moved so much coal that the Titanic was now off-centered, so it was sailing with this three degree list to port. This three-degree list to port would also have another impact inside the Titanic's Grand Staircase. You see, on this day, there was a first-class passenger, and she was walking down these stairs, but the flooring of the Grand Staircase was made of this limonium tile, and it had just been recently mopped, so the floor was actually really wet. So as she was walking down these stairs, she was thrown off balance by the three-degree list, and due to the fact that this floor was wet, so what happened? She fell down the stairs and broke her arm. But she was, she was quickly taken to the ship's doctor who patched her up, and she was able to go to dinner that night. So there were no lasting effects to this little tumble down the stairs. There would be one more big event on board the RMS Titanic today. You see, as the Titanic was sailing along, a lot of the passengers were sending private messages home via the Marconi wireless system. You know, talk, sending messages to their friends, their family, you know, telling them how the voyage was going, etc., etc. And Jack Phillips and Harold Bright had a lot of messages that they were going through. But as they were doing their job, you know, sending these messages, the Marconi wireless machine broke. Now, according to the manual, if your Marconi wireless system breaks while you're on a ship and en route, do not try to fix it. Switch over to the emergency system. And they could have done this. However, the emergency system does not have anywhere near the range of the main Marconi wireless. The emergency system can go about 50 miles, whereas the main Marconi wireless can go around 300 miles. Sometimes you can even push that to 1,000 miles given the right atmospheric conditions. So, anyway, they decided to go ahead and try to fix the Marconi wireless, even though they were expressly forbidden from doing so. In the Marconi wireless manual, do not try to fix it, period. That's just how it goes. But they worked long into the night and into the early mornings of April 14th, and they did actually manage to fix the Marconi wireless. And if they hadn't have done that, that would have had serious repercussions on the night of April 14th slash 15th when the Titanic had struck the iceberg. 
It is Sunday, April 14, 1912, and the Titanic is still making very good time. Where it's Sunday morning, there are church services happening all throughout the ship, and things are proceeding pretty normally on board the Titanic as the morning progresses. Now on Sunday morning, this is also the time that a lifeboat drill was scheduled to be commenced on board the Titanic. However, the Titanic was making such good time and the engines were really being efficient right now that the crew on board did not want to stop the engines, lower a lifeboat to do a drill, and then turn the engines back on again. They had already had a lifeboat drill while the Titanic was in Southampton and it went without incident, so they didn't really see the need to do it again. The Titanic's Marconi wireless system was brought back online around 4 or 5 a.m. on the morning of the 14th, so Jack Phillips and Harold Bride were also hard at work dealing with all the backlog of passenger messages that had been accumulating while the wireless system was offline. Now on the 14th of April, this was the day that the Titanic received the most ice warnings throughout the entire voyage. I think somewhere around six ice warnings were received on the ship. Now, most of these ice warnings had two things in common. Number one was that they reported that there was ice around, but number two, they said that the visibility and, how, and the conditions around the ice was perfectly clear. So the way, what the crew on board the Titanic was thinking is, sure, there's icebergs ahead, but we have perfect visibility. You know, there's no problem. We'll see these icebergs long before there's any threat to the Titanic. So this was kind of the mindset at the time. And Jack Phillips and Harold Bride, the two wireless operators on the Titanic, were even more busy because they were still continuing to try to deal with all the backlog of messages that had been accumulating from the day before when the Marconi Wireless was offline. On the evening of April the 14th, Captain Smith went to the bridge and talked to Second Officer Charles Lightoller, who was still on duty in the early part of the evening, and asked him what the conditions were on board the Titanic. And Lightoller said the conditions are still clear and calm. So they, from their perspective, you know, even though they knew there was ice in the area, the conditions on board the Titanic and the visibility was perfect. So at this point, they still didn't see any need to slow the Titanic down. If there was any icebergs ahead, we would see it long before it would be any risk to the Titanic. Right after the captain and second officer Charles Lightoller had this conversation, the captain did tell Lightoller that he was going to go back to his cabin to get some rest, but to keep a sharp eye on the conditions around the Titanic, and if anything was to change, they were to wake him and let him know as soon as possible. Second officer Charles Lightoller agreed, and then the captain went back to his room. Now, not too long after this happened, Lightoller also went off duty, and first officer William Murdoch went on duty. Lightoller told Murdoch the captain's instructions, Murdoch agreed, and then Lightoller also retired to his cabin for the night. Now, at this point, the Titanic is still cruising along, selling at around 21, 22 knots, and back in the Titanic's Marconi wireless room, Jack Phillips and Harold Bribe are also hard at work, sending, still working on the huge backlog of messages from the passengers. Now, Jack Phillips and Harold Bribe, they're communicating with a place called Cape Race, which is really far away from the Titanic. And the way Marconi technology worked is the further away a place is, the louder you have to turn the volume up on your headset in order to hear the faint dots and dashes of the Morse code. So while they're doing this, they're relaying the passengers' messages to Cape Race, who will then relay it to wherever else they need to go. Another steamship called the Californian tries to message the Titanic, and the Californian is really close to the Titanic. But because the Titanic's radio was turned up so high, when the Californian messaged it in, it came through as a sharp ring in Jack Phillips' ears. And he got so irritated, he just ripped his headset off, slammed on the ground, and then sent an angry message to the Californian. Keep out, shut up, I'm busy, I'm talking to Cape Race. Now, a lot of people like to fault Jack Phillips for this, but what you have to remember is, he had been up for probably a little over 40 hours at this point. He was up all night working the, uh, fixing the wireless machine. He was up all day sending these passengers messages. He was extremely tired. And then on top of that, he just got a loud ring in his ears. I can understand why he would get mad. Wouldn't anybody else? I mean, what he did wasn't right. Don't take what I'm saying out of context. But all I'm saying is, I get why it happened. The ship you see in this picture is the SS Californian, the ship that Jack Phillips on board the Titanic just cut off. Now, what Jack Phillips didn't realize is that in the message that the Californian was trying to send to the Titanic was the Californian was trying to warn the Titanic that they were stopped, stuck in a massive ice field, and that the Californian decided to stop for the evening. And they were just trying to relay that message to the Titanic before Jack Phillips rudely brushed off the ship. 
Now, right after this, the Californian's wireless operator decided to go to bed for the evening. And when he did that, he was the only wireless operator on board the Californian. So when he switched off the radio, he essentially cut ties to the Titanic, and the Titanic lost contact with the closest ship to her while the Titanic was steaming rapidly into an ice field. It is currently 11.37 p.m. on board the RMS Titanic, and the Titanic is still sailing along at 21, 22 knots. In the Titanic's crow's nest at the very front of the ship, Frederick Fleet and Reginald Lee are looking way out into the dark to try to spot any icebergs or any threats to the Titanic. And then on the Titanic's bridge, First Officer William Murdoch is also on duty, and he is also trying to look out into the dark to spot any icebergs or any threats to the Titanic. As the minutes tick by, as we come up on 11.40 p.m., First Officer William Murdoch suddenly hears three sharp clangs on the crow's nest bell. Anyway, guys, that's it for this video. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and found it interesting. And yeah, I hope you guys liked my little attempt to end this video with kind of a little cliffhanger ending. That was kind of fun to do. But yeah, guys, so tune in next time for the next video. We are actually going to be talking about the sinking events of the RMS Titanic. That video is due to be released on the anniversary of the Titanic. This Wednesday will be the 109th anniversary of the sinking of the RMS Titanic. Now, also on that day, I'm hoping I can pull all this off. I'm planning to release a video and I'm also going to have a live stream so I hope you all can tune in for that as well all right everybody well hey thank you all so much for watching thank you all so much for being here and hey you all stay safe out there and I'll see you in the next one have a good night everybody